Hello and welcome to our lecture for Chapter 2, Asset and Liability Valuation and Income Recognition. So we are going to focus on the mixed attribute accounting model. So we want to simplify the complexity of valuation of assets and liabilities when, within real companies. So what we propose is an application of a standardized framework where we analyze the impact of events and transactions on the financial statement. This is recommended by GAAP, which FASB generates, and IFRSs, which the IASB generate. So FASB is the Financial Accounting Standards Board, and IASB is the International Accounting Standards Board. So we have asset and liability valuation. So our, our FASB statement number two gives us a primary quality of accounting that says accounting should be relevant and reliable, right? And so this is the statement of financial accounting concepts number two. And then we have valuation of assets and liability that reflects several different formats, right? So we have this historical data, we might have current information, and then we have our expectations of future outcomes as well. So the mixed attribute accounting model is used to give us an optimal mix of that relevant and reliable information in the financial statement. And it helps users to translate the information so they can assess risk, timing, and future cash flows. So here we have our valuation models and we have our historical method, we have our combined method and our current value method. And we have assets and liabilities in each of these. And we have assets that are presented in our initial present value, our acquisition costs or our adjusted acquisition costs. Or we might have assets in our fair value, in our replacement cost or our net realizable value. So our acquisition cost, that is the amount that we actually paid initially to get the asset. It includes all costs required to prepare the asset for its intended use. So you might add sales tax, shipping, repair and maintenance, but it excludes the cost to operate the asset. Now we have an adjusted historical cost. So this is a service potential and it's consumed gradually or immediately. So the asset is reduced and an expense is increased. So we might have buildings, equipment, and other depreciable assets or intangibles that have limited lives and we record that usage. And then we have present value. So that is our monetary asset or liability. The present value computation gives us the appropriate interest rate. It might be our investments in bonds held to maturity. It might be our long-term receivables and payables, our non-current unearned revenues, or our current receivables and current payables. Then we have our fair value. So FASB tells us that we need to uh, do our fair value at the exit price, but our International Accounting Standards Boards tell us it could be the exit or the entry price. So this is obtaining the right price. So we have different sources of fair values and we might have a three tier hierarchy and that is provided to us in the Statement of Financial Accounting Standards number 157 or the International Financial Reporting Standards number seven. And some examples of what we would record at fair value are investments in our marketable equity and debt securities. It might be financial instruments or, deriv or derivative instruments. All of those we would record at fair value. So here we have our current replacement cost and our net realizable value and what we base our fair value on and we give you examples and features. So this is a really lovely table to have on hand. Now let's talk about income recognition. So we have recognition. It's making an entry to record a transaction for an event. So in the real world, all changes uh, in the economic value of a firm are not always reflected, right? We're reporting cash inflows and outflows based on reliable and relevant for predicting our future cash flows. 
So here we have several approaches to income recognition, and we are always looking at the relevance and reliability, and we talk about each of these approaches and how they are traditional or hybrid or conservative in nature. So let's talk about our second approach, which is pretty much a hybrid of the first and the third approach. And it's an attempt to incorporate the benefits of the relevant and timely fair values on the balance sheet while we still want to maintain our net income volatility. And we're allowed to use this per gap and per IFRS. So here we also have how we're going to determine our financial performance. So we have, again, alternative sets of rules where our option one, we can report cash outflows and inflows. Our option two, we want to capture those economies independent of their cash flows. And our option three, we want to use rules specifically designed for the taxing authorities. So typically we like to fall within, I would say, option one and two. Income taxes, as we all know, they significantly affect um, the analysis of a firm, right? Expenses under accrual accounting does not necessarily equal what you owe in taxes. Remember, accrual accounting is gap, and for taxes, we typically use um, cash basis. So these are differences between financial reporting and tax reporting, or what we like to call book to tax. And they can be permanent differences or temporary differences. And here we have a nice example. So our permanent differences appear in the financial statements, but they are not necessarily on our tax return. This can include our tax exempt revenue or non-deductible fines and penalties. And there's typically no impact on the balance sheet for our permanent differences. But in our temporary differences, that might impact our balance sheet with a deferred tax asset or a deferred tax liability. And here are temporary differences included in both the net income and the taxable income, but they might be in different periods. And these examples are depreciation and warranty expenses. So now we want to measure our income tax expense, and we have two approaches the income statement approach or the balance sheet approach, which was supported by FASB 109 or IAS, International Accounting Standards 12. And so we have here that we have income taxes on our taxable income, and we're gonna increase or decrease based on our deferred tax liability and our deferred tax assets. So here we have a future tax deduction and a future taxable income and examples of these temporary differences that we might encounter when measuring our income tax expense. So we might have our tax basis of assets that exceeds our financial reporting, or it might be less than to generate a liability, or we might have our tax basis of assets is less than our financial reporting basis, or it um, exceeds our financial reporting basis. Then we have discontinued operations and extraordinary items. So under US GAAP, income, net of their income tax effects from discontinued operation, and then income tax expense reflects income taxes on income from continuing operations only. Then we have under IFRSs, they do not permit extraordinary items and then exceptional or material items could be disclosed separately, but they have to include the income tax effects. So both GAAP and IFRS have different approaches to discontinued operations and extraordinary items. Keep that in mind based on the company that you're looking at. Then we have other comprehensive income, and these would include certain items, but net of taxes. You might have unrealized changes in the market value of marketable securities or hedged financial instruments or derivatives. That might include your foreign currency translation adjustments would be part of your other comprehensive income. And if there are changes in your pension or other post-employment benefits and assets and liabilities, that would be included in other comprehensive income. And here is our overview of the analytical framework that we're looking at, right? So we're always looking at the balance sheet 
And the balance sheet is assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity or owners' equity. And then we have our contributed capital, which is our net stock transactions with our shareholders. And then we have our accumulated other comprehensive income, which can include those unrealized gains or losses on certain types of assets and liabilities that we might hold until realization. And then our retained earnings is basically our net income less our dividends. So this is the analytical framework that we use for the balance sheet. And here you see uh, an example and you see basically the transaction side, the assets, the liabilities and the stockholders equity, contributed capital, the accumulated other comprehensive income and your retained earnings. And everything balances. That's the beauty of our analysis and of accounting. And we have reached the end of this video lecture. Thank you for watching.